So the respiratory system. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about the rest of it. Are we okay, you guys? We're all good to go? Yeah. All right. Thanks. Let's go ahead. Let's get into the system, and uh, we'll go from there. So um, <clears throat> so this is just, uh, so we'll talk about the drugs of the respiratory system in general. We have the upper and we have the lower respiratory tracts. So eventually we will, uh, we will, uh, cover some of the drugs that uh, treats the upper respiratory tract, and then we'll go into the lower after that. So this is just a review for uh, the upper and lower respiratory tract. We know that, uh, you know, we have the nasal cavity, we have the larynx, we have the larynx, all right, epiglottis, all that is, um, is part of the upper, and then we have the lower, anything below the, uh, so trachea and down is lower respiratory tract. So, um, so let's go ahead and look at some of the uh, receptors. We talked about some of the receptors during pharmacology last, last quarter, if you remember, a bunch of different ones, but these are the ones that we are concerned about when it comes to, um, uh, hold on, let me see if, is, is this recording or not? Yeah, it's recording. Yeah, it is okay. recording. It's recording, good. Okay, so, um, so, so we have uh, so we have the autonomic nervous system type of um, uh, uh, receptors. So in this case, we have the adrenergic, we have the cholinergic, and then we have the histamine receptors that we can work on. So when we talk about adrenergic, which would be epinephrine, right, and um, and norepinephrine, of course. But in this case, we're talking about epinephrine. Uh, so sympathetic. Uh, uh, receptors and then for the <laughs> we will have uh, acetyl. For these epinephrine receptors uh, that are found in lungs and we uh, that are found in the blood vessel and then the um, uh, connection is unstable. Okay, well, I hope it's okay. Uh, alpha-1, so alpha-1 for the blood vessel, beta-1 in the heart, we talked about this last quarter. So alpha-2 and beta-2, that's what we're dealing with now when we talk about lungs, okay? So uh, a little different. So um, alpha-1, they increase heart rate, not alpha-2, increase heart rate, and then bronchodilation uh, for, for these adrenergic uh, um, you know, receptors. So cholinergic receptors, we have muscarinic and uh, nicotinic receptors, which are part of the cholinergic uh, acetylcholine receptors. So what they do is they do the opposite of epinephrine in this case. So they slow the heart rate, they cause bronchoconstriction, increase saliva and peristalsis. So we need to be careful with that. So if we need to um, you know, open up your airways, then we give you an alpha two, beta two type of um, uh, agonist and we'll open up your uh, receptors. Uh, but when it comes to parasympathetic, then we need to stimulate the muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. And we use an anticholinergic in this case. I'm sorry, we block them, not, not uh, so we block them. When we block them, then you have bronchodilation. So in this case, the cholinergics, they cause slow heart rate, bronchoconstriction. So we're going to be using anticholinergic drugs to open the airways. Histamines also, uh, they cause all kinds of uh, issues. Uh, the swelling of the mucosa, uh, histamine causes drainage, uh, you know, runny eye and all that stuff. So we use antihistamines to uh, dry you up. So these are the drugs that we can use in the upper respiratory tract, antihistamines, antitossives, decongestants, expectorants, mucolytics, bronchodilators, anti-inflammatory, and respiratory stimulants. So, uh, so these are the ones that we use. And um, uh, so it depends on what, what the different category is. We'll, we'll discuss them as we go on. 
So oxygen therapy is always uh, uh, good to treat uh, hypoxia. Uh, normally, you want to be above 91%, of course, to be alive. You know, so, uh, well, I mean, you can go below. But, uh, but this is the minimum that you can uh, get to uh, without being affected uh, or collapsing and, you know. So rate of oxygen flow is two liters per minute. That's what they uh, give usually when you, they give oxygen therapy. Must be a prescribed to deliver, no smoking. All right, so, uh, so here are some of the categories. Let's look at antihistamines. They block the H1 receptors, and these are the ones that you find on smooth muscles, endothelial cells. Many of it is in the nose and nasal cavity, so if you have pollen, dust, or something that goes on there and agitate them, then uh, automatically they cause all the histamine type of uh, side effects in general. Antitossive, okay, antitossive would be the ones that we give to uh, suppress uh, coughing, and usually they work on the medulla oblongata at the cough receptor, uh, the cough uh, center there. Decongestant, we just uh, release the congestion there, so it decreases the blood flow, decreases the over overproduction of the secretion. That's what you do with the decongestants. Expectorants, these are the ones that promotes coughing. So when you uh, need to cough the mucus that you have, we give the patients expectorants. And many of the patients that uh, lay down for a long period of time and all the mucus kind of sits in their lungs, you give them an expectorant to cough it out. Now be careful when you buy over-the-counter medications uh, like uh, Rubitus and any of these, uh, uh, one of, uh, any, any of the antitoxic medications Sometimes they'll say it has an expectorant in it. So if it does, then uh, you'll be coughing more than uh, suppressing the cough. So uh, you have to check basically what, what, you, uh, what you can see. Okay, mucolytic. Okay, that's, that's basically when you liqu uh, liqu uh, liquefy the, the mucus, the secretion. You break it apart with this mucolytic. So if you take any mucolytic, you're gonna break apart the uh, the secretions and the, um, yeah. All right, so here are histamines in general. So we have, um, uh, and so if, if you have his, histamine causes all that, right? So it causes uh, vasodilation, increased capillary permeability. So you cause a little edema and swelling in the face sometimes because of that, if you're allergic to certain things. Flushy, leaky capillaries, you know, histamine does that. Um, so, um, you know, so when you have vasodilation, you have lower blood pressure, uh, bronchoconstriction, you see, that's the issue with you not being able to breathe when histamine kicks in. That's why we give you antihistamines to reverse all that. So see, NS effects, cognition, memory, and sleep cycle. So these are important to, uh, go with. So, um, itchy, runny nose, watery eyes, and all that, it's caused by histamine. So to treat all these symptoms, we need to give you some antihistamines. Two different types of antihistamines. You have first generation, you have second generation. First generation is everybody knows that one, which is Benadryl, diphenhydramine. And that is the one that we take usually for a long period of time kind of thing. So if you're like having uh, like continuous allergies, you know, they put you on dihydramine. Second generations are used usually for a shorter period of time, like for temporary type of allergic reactions that you get. So Zyrtec, Lertin, all these uh, uh, loratadine and uh, Zitrazine also, these are used uh, for as a second generation. They're over the counter. Benadryl is over the counter also, you know, but it's, it's more systemic. All right, so combo antihistamine decongestant sometimes together, you know, that would help you out. Uh, uh, loratadine has a, is a combo in general. Pseudofedrin, Clardin D, is very commonly used also. Uh, Dr. Day, I had a question about, yes. um, about those first few points underneath, the, underneath histamine. 
um, are you presenting um, what what histamine effects are? Yeah, when it says histamine, that's what histamine presents you with. So we use okay. antihistamines. That means we, we reverse all the histamine uh, effects. Okay. So you reverse everything so, up on the top. Okay, so these, so these first four points, those are just the manifestations of histamine. Yes, the first four okay. points are under what histamine does to you normally, physiologically. Okay. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Thank Absol you. Absolutely. All right, good. <clears throat> so here comes the antihistamine action. So if you look at these histamine uh, points here, you need antihistamine reverses all that. So instead of causing low blood pressure, it's going to increase your blood pressure. And cause, and instead of causing bronchoconstriction, it's going to open up your, your airways. So that's why we use them. We use the antihistamines. So you feel better actually with antihistamines, you know, but it's not good to use for, um, you know, antihistamine should not be used if you have hypertension, right? Because it causes vasoconstriction automatically and you should not be using that for it. So here are the, the antihistamines. So it blocks the activity of H1 receptors. So it reverses all the histamine uh, mechanism of action. Uh, now, first generation crosses the blood-brain barrier, okay? That means what? It goes to your brain, so it causes sedation. So when you take Benadryl, it causes you sedation. The second generation does not, so that's why we tell you to use Zyrtec, for example, uh, in order if, if you don't want a set, a, you know, something that causes sedation too. But uh, systemic, we use Benadryl because it's... Uh, uh, it's for longer period type of type of allergies and um, you know issues issues with histamine, but uh, second generation is good for us. You know short like seasonal allergies you get them you use Zyrtec, and if you're a driver you don't want to use Benadryl. You know uh, Zyrtec is better because it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier, so it doesn't cause uh, sedation. Indication first generation, so here we go, long-term allergies, short-term allergies, second generation, most effective if given before symptoms appear. So it's better, you know, if you have seasonal allergies, put yourself on it right away before you get the sneezing and all that, because it'll prevent it from coming back, from coming. You know, it'll be more difficult to control uh, the symptoms when you are already in. Fuck no, dude, what are you fucking dying? Oh, oh. Aaron, I can hear you. Is there a oh. mute? So mute, mute. No, I, I just got a text from a friend of mine. I, I'm sorry. Otherwise, we'll know your secrets, you know? Yeah, so, sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So it's more effective before you get the symptoms. So anti antihistamines, you got to take them every day. To, to, to help you, you know, uh, if, if, if you take them once and you stop or you take them for a week and you stop, things come back. So if you get the effect immediately, it'll take sometimes a little time for it to kick in, like a few days. So you really have to keep on it and take it every day to relieve the symptoms. So adverse effects, drowsiness, sedation, like we said, confusion could be part of the, uh, more of the first generation. Anticholinergic drugs in general, uh, symptoms, that's what you get with antihistamines. So when you get that, you know, there's a, a mnemonic for it, which is abduct. So and for anhydrosis, um, what is anhydrosis, you guys, anybody? Uh, inability to sweat. Yep, you dry up. So listen, think of anticholinergic effects as drying up. You're drying up, so you're not sweating. You have blurred vision, blurred vision because you have uh, lesser fluid, you know, in your eyes, so you get a little blurred vision. Dry mouth, urinary retention because you're not urinating much. Constipation because you're dry, and tachycardia because of the uh, blocking the acetylcholine in this case. So. Uh, you're promoting epinephrine to kick in a little bit more, so you, you end up having tachycardia because of that. Because uh, cholinergic, again, uh, 
uh, acetylcholine is cholinergic, so it slows down the heart. So when I give you anticholinergic, it's going to do the opposite, which is tachycardia. All right, so decongestant are the other classification, uh, pseudoephridine, uh, 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 okay, pseudofed uh, is, the, is the common one. That's the most popular one. And uh, the other ones also, phenylephine also, um, ephrine, all these guys there are used as uh, decongestant. So what did we say decongestant do? Uh, they're sympathomimetic. They activate the alpha-1 receptor on the blood vessels and nose. So when this happens, uh, then um, you cause local vasoconstriction. So, um, so if you have congestion, what are we trying to do? We're trying to stop you from being congested. And usually when you dilate blood vessels and all that, you have more secretion coming out of the blood vessels and you become congested. So we want to vasoconstrict you so you don't have a lot of fluid coming out. So you use sympathomimetics type of uh, uh, drugs, which are decongestants. They work on the alpha-1 receptor. We know alpha-1 receptor causes vasoconstriction. So when you vasoconstrict, you have less fluid, less swelling will be coming out. Promotion of drainage in the sinuses. See, this is the trick here. The drainage will go into your sinuses and that will be an issue. And sometimes you will get headaches because of this. So you will get headaches because of this. And uh, the, uh, so uh, non-selective alpha receptors causes systemic vasoconstriction. So we have certain ones that are alpha receptors, selective alpha receptors, and non-selective uh, alpha receptors. Uh, so if, if you have the selective ones, um, uh, then uh, they only cause vasoconstriction in the upper respiratory tract. But if uh, they're uh, non-selective, then they cause vasoconstriction in the blood vessels all over your body and can lead to hypertension. So indication, common cold, sinusitis. Now here's the story. Because we send all the congestion into your sinuses, you're going to end up having what we call rebound congestion. So rebound congestion is you eventually get congested again because some of the drainage that goes into the sinus will drain back into your nasal cavity and your throat, and then you'll be still congested again. So these are called rebound congestion. That's if you, um, if your patient takes decongestant for more than three days. So when you take it for a long period of time, you can have an issue which is called rebound congestion, like getting congested again. CNS excitation, hyperactivity, and irritability. So this is, uh, uh, because of the um, alpha-1 receptors, uh, you can get uh, hyperactive and irritable because of that. So I have a question. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, I had a question. So you mentioned about re rebound congestion, um, and, you t and you said that it occurs in patients that take it for more than three days. Now, is that consecutively, or is it um, in general? Consec cons uh, you know, consecutively. But it doesn't, okay. mean, um, it doesn't mean that everybody gets it. But there are certain people that will get it, yes. Okay. Yes, you have to take this every day in order to get this. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. So contraindications it would be patient with hypertension. Well, because, you know, it causes vasoconstriction. So if you, if you have hypertension, it's not good. Glaucoma also increased in fluid in the eye. So that's increased pressure in there. So it's contraindicated. Nasal irritation, polyps and all that. Right, and polyp is going to block the nasal cavity from breathing. So this is going to cause vasoconstriction further. And uh, so you can have issues with that because of this. All right, uh, then we can use steroids here as decongestants. And we know steroids are uh, glucocorticoids. And these are anti-inflammatory, anti-immune. So you need to keep always in your mind that steroids are anti-inflammatory and at the same time they are anti-immune. That means they cause 
uh, your immune system to shut uh, to you know that shut down, but to get uh, immune compromised. So these are some of the drugs that we will use uh, uh, alone. We cover these when we talk about steroids in general, if you remember uh, last quarter, and we talked about them being used in the for respiratory tract. And um, so Flonase is a spray that you insert into the nose and you know, nasal cord, same thing. Uh, action relief of inflammation, uh, exact mechanism of action is not known. We don't know how steroids in general, but they, uh, but they cause uh, relief inflammation usually. Indication, uh, seasonal allergies, rhinitis inflammation after removal of a nasal polyp. So this is good. After you take a polyp out, you can give them, uh, if you have an inflama uh, inflammation after the nasal, you know, steroids is, is being used in, in general. Uh, pharmacokinetics, that means the way it moves in your body, generally not absorbed systematically. Contraindication acute infection. Because it's anti-immune. So if you have an infection and you give you steroids, you're going to cause more infection. Adverse effect, local burning, irritation, stinging. Uh, steroids is stinging. You know, when you get, get that nasal spray and you spray it in your nose, you feel a little stinging in the nose. Sometimes dryness in the, in the nasal cavity, and you, so you'll feel like a little irritation there. Dryness of the mucosa and headaches. Now, suppression of healing, we know that we talked about steroids. When you do that, you suppress the healing, so it'll take you a longer time for you to heal. So a patient who has nasal surgery or trauma, it takes them a little longer time for them to heal. But they'll heal eventually, but it takes a little more time. So these are nasal steroids, decongestants. So Start relieving of inflammation, we know that we have edema from inflammation, correct? So these are like it's going to reduce the amount of edema because of the inflammation. That's how it helps you. So anti-tossive, anti-cough, that's what they do. So they, what they do is they suppress the cough center reflex in the medulla oblongata there. So uh, it controls you from uh, uh, coughing. So um, we have the narcotics, we have the non-narcotic type of antitossives. Codeine, whenever you have codeine with it, then it's, it's, uh, it's narcotic. So we have codeine with uh, guaifenesin and uh, promethazine also, promethazine. So guaifenesin, um, is, is uh, ant, an antitoxin. So when we put codeine with it, then it can uh, keep, you know, put you into sedation also, because codeine is narcotics. So these are more sedatives. When you have codeine in them, uh, they have more sed you know, they, they cause more sedation. Hydrocodone also, there are many, we, we know about codone, co co you know, codeine, uh, the side effects of it, which is main, mainly C CNS, side effects. Non-narcotics ones, it doesn't have narcotics in it. Um, so benzotate, benzotate is, is, is the most commonly used. Uh, and uh, dextromethorphan also, delsum is, is used. You can mix them up with guy, uh, guaifenesin also, like rubitussin DM. And you have diphenhydramine is used also as anti tosset but it's not caused primary, you know, it's not the first choice that you give. So action again on the medulla oblongata center, it depresses that cough center so you don't cough anymore from there. Uh, controls non-productive cough. So now a lot of people with, uh, with uh, COVID-19, they put them on the uh, codeine with uh, guaifenesin to stop coughing because it stops the center, you know, the, the uh, cough center in the medulla there. 
Contraindication, patient who needs to cough to maintain the airway. So um, if somebody wants to get the excretion out, you can't give them antitoxin because they're gonna stop coughing and they're gonna retain all the, all the fluid inside them. So, um, and then head injury or impaired CNS. So who can relate this to me and tell me how would head injury or impaired CNS can uh, affect this? It's contraindicated. Because you have altered function of the medulla. Absolutely. So you can actually, when you have impaired CNS, it could be any part of your brain. Head injury also, we don't know if the medulla is working, functioning well, so right away you should not be given it. So adverse effect, respiratory depression, okay, that would be some of the, uh, so this is, this is important, okay? And CNS adverse effects also, drying effect of the mucus, GI upset, drug to drug, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which are uh, antidepressant, right? So Doctor, you, I have a question about that. About what? Monoamines. Is it yeah. for both the steroid and non-steroid or just for one? You're talking about uh, this, which is antitoxic, codeine or no codeine? Is that what so both of them, it's drug to drug interaction with both? Uh, um, you know, I'm assuming probably the, uh, the one with the codeine more, you know, if okay. you codeine, because we know codeine can affect, interact with, uh, the monoamine because they have the, you know, the, uh, amine in there. But, uh, but yeah, I would say the one with, with the codeines, the narcotic ones more. Okay. Thank you. So the next ones would be your expectorants. These are the ones that you want people to cough more. So this is to clear their lungs. You know, if you have people congested in their lungs and you want them to clear and you want them to cough, then you give them expectorants. So guaifenesin is the one, the major one that we use. So you go ahead and get them to cough more. Uh, Mucinex is the one that is very famous, you know, people buying it. Uh, Humabid or robitussin also but make sure that the rubitussin has guaifenesin in it, you know, because some rubitussins don't have this. Uh, so, um, so these are expectants and don't buy, if you're trying to suppress your cough, don't buy the rubitussin that has guaifenesin in it because you're gonna be coughing a lot more than stopping. So it enhances the output of respiratory tract fluid by reducing the adhesiveness and surface tension of these fluid, allowing easier movement of the less viscous secretions. So you reduce this, the secretion, the amount of viscous secretion inside the, inside the, uh, the nasal cavity. All right, so indications, airway clearance, uh, upper respiratory tract infection and influenza. So these are kind of, you know, if you have influenza also, you can get the spit out, you know, by using some of that also. So, uh, upper respiratory tract administration given in a combination with cough medications, you know, you give them with both sometimes. It depends on what you are, what's your purpose, you know, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to clear stuff? Are you trying to just, if it's a dry cough, okay, then you go with the uh, antitoxic. If it's a productive cough, then you want to give it, give them this. And sometimes, again, like we said, you can mix guaifenesin with dextromethorphan. Uh, if you use this, then you, you know that you want them to get some fluid out, you know, when you mix both of them. This is an expectorant and this is a cough, a, a center. So you stop from coughing in, um, uh, in, in the center, but you promote coughing to get the secretion out. It's a weird mechanism, you know, so, but it works. All right, so these are some adverse effects. GI symptoms, you know, nausea and vomiting, sometimes headache, dizziness, mild rash, prolonged use may result in masking, a serious under, uh, underlying disorder. So um, 
if you take it for a long time, sometimes if you have a symptom that been subside for a while, it can come out. Okay, uh, you know, usually uh, people that has like a certain uh, uh, you you notice people sometimes that have um, some type of uh, twitch and they will get the twitch back. That's what they've seen sometimes. Uh, so these are like um, some kind of mass serious underlying disorder that you never, you know, you stopped having and these things can cause this. So you um, need to be careful with that. So mucolytics, these are the ones that you break down the mucus and you make it smaller, smaller, and you'll be able to get it out. So acetocysteine is the one that uh, is mo the most common, and this one is used as muco mist. So you put that in the uh, humidifiers a lot. You add it to the humidifier, and then you start getting all the secretions out from, from your upper respiratory tract in general. So it breaks chemical bonds of mucus and lowering the viscosity in order to aid the high risk respiratory patient in coughing up thick, uh, tenacious secretion. So anybody that has very, very serious, uh, you know, fluid congestion, you use this. So you put them in nebulizers, sometimes bronchodilators, are given 15 minutes prior to dilate the bronchial tree. So if you're gonna put them on mucolytics, you need to put them on bronchodilators about 15 minutes prior because you need to open up the airways first. Otherwise, it'll be difficult for them to uh, cough the secretion out. So with nebulizer, you put them on some bronchodilator first and then you go ahead into, um, into giving them the mucolytic. Direct installation into the trachea. Usually you put that into the trachea if you need to give this. Even though here it says upper respiratory, but you use this for lower respiratory also. So, um, you know, a couple of these drugs also you use for upper and lower, you know, depending on what you need uh, to use it for. So indications, treatment of cystic fibrosis. Anyone knows what cystic fibrosis is? Yeah. Isn't it like an overproduction of like mucus and glandular like secretions in the lungs and I think like pancreas or digestive? Yeah, absolutely. Good job. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So when you have this, then we need to get that secretion out. So you put them on some mucolytic type of humidifier, specifically if they have it in their lungs, in their airways. So they can't breathe. Those kids cannot breathe. So you put them on some of that used by some doctors to protect renal functions. So uh, <clears throat> it's not strongly uh, supported by research, but uh, some people, they say, if you need uh, to protect the renal failure uh, from any type of, uh, uh, you know, like type of uh, uh, renal, you know, urination and so on. So, um, so there's a chance, but there's, it's, you know, don't worry about this. It's not very supported. Patients who have difficulty coughing by up, up secretion, that's one thing for sure. Uh, atelectasis. So what is atelectasis, you guys? The collapse of uh, alveoli. Yeah, collapse lungs, collapse alveoli. So if you have, uh, sometimes could a blockage causes this? like an airway blockage with that can cause uh, atelectasis. Absolutely, yep. yeah, yeah, because you have, air has to go in and out, right, from the airways into the alveoli. And if you have a mucus plugged there, you're not gonna have enough air going in, so they're gonna collapse. So in order for your lungs to stay inflated, you have to have air in them. As soon as you take the air out, they deflate, it's like a balloon. So if you have atelectasis due to 
a mucus plug than use this medication. Patients undergoing diagnostic bronchoscopy. So before you go do a bronchoscopy on someone, you need to make sure that the airway is clear of mucus. Post-operative patients uh, with tracheostomies. So what is a tracheostomy? If they put a tube in their throat. <laughs> yeah, into the trachea. So, uh, so go ahead. Go ahead, Vernon. No, sorry, I was just repeating what you said. Yeah. Uh, so, so you need to uh, clear their throat because you do before you do this. So, adverse effect, uh, GI upset. You know, GI upset is is one of the common effects with all these guys, all these drugs. Uh, some stomatitis. What is stomatitis? Inflammation of the stomach. Would it be stomach? Nope. Maybe the mouth. What? Mouth. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Stomatitis is mouth. So you'll have like inflammation around your mouth. Uh, Rhinorrhea. What is runny it? Nose. You have a runny nose. Runny nose. Yeah. Rhinorrhea is runny nose. Bronchospasm. Rash, esophageal varices, what are these? Arteries or veins in the esophagus? So, uh, capillaries, yeah. something like that? Veins, actually. So esophageal var varices are veins. They're uh, defected valves in the veins like hemorrhoids. So uh, you have defected valves in the veins of the esophagus that causes to bulging. And these are esophageal varices. Like varicose veins. You heard of varicose veins before? These are varicose veins in the esophagus. That's what they are. Uh, which of the following is an adverse reaction to topical nasal steroids? What do you think? Anybody want to guess? No one wants to guess. Does it cause increased nasal drainage, steroids? So what is steroids? What's the function of steroids? They're anti-inflammatory and um, immune. Anti-immune, yes. I want, you to, I want you guys to remember this by heart. Anybody that tells you what does steroids do? You say anti-inflammatory? anti-immune because we can use them for both so we when we want to suppress your immune system we can use steroids when we want to treat your inflammation we use steroids in there so you know nasal drainage has nothing to do it doesn't increase it actually it decreases it so rebound effect if you remember rebound effect is with what which classification we said rebound effects decongestant. decongestants yes decongestant what about suppression of healing is that caused by steroids? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, we covered that. Remember I told you that? So remember this. So when you apply steroids to patients and they are bleeding from a cut or so, guess what? It's going to take them a little longer time for them to heal. They'll heal eventually, but it will pro pro prolong the healing process. Okay? Uh, because it, it suppresses inflammation. And inflammation is actually a process where you eventually heal from. So when you suppress that, you're not going to heal as, as, uh, as good. And then ulceration, it doesn't cause ulceration. All right, good job. How about this? What drug enhances the output of respiratory tract fluid by reducing the adhesiveness and surface tension? Well, I didn't talk about this, did I? Oh, uh, which facility? Yeah, yeah, I did that. I did, uh, uh, 
don't know if I talk about surface tensor, but go ahead, give it a shot. Up respiratory fluid by reducing the adhesiveness and the surface tension of the fluid. Wouldn't that be a mucolytic? So yes. So which one? C. C. Acetylcysteine. Absolutely. That is the one that kind of breaks down the mucus, right? And uh, viscous mucus, removal of viscous mucus. Yep. All right. So this one I will cover on uh, on uh, uh, Wednesday when I see you because this chapter is good. very small, very nice. I expect everybody to get 100 on this test. Okay, it's going to be a nice, easy chapter, two chapters actually, 54 and 55, but it will be very, very uh, easy. Let's just go ahead and look at the chart real fast, okay? So, uh, hey, Dr. J. Yeah. Just a quick question. Um, I don't know if you uploaded it within the last couple of days, but, and I know we're not in Pathophys right now. But the first recording for Pathophys was posted, but the second one was not. So at some point today, can you just upload it, please? Yeah, you know what? Um, I've been having issues. I could not. So I need I need some of you to record these as well. You know, I give you the per, I gave you the permission to record because sometimes I have issues with this thing. I don't know why. You oh, know? we can record them. Ourselves. Yes, I, I'm giving you a permission to record. I put down as part of the settings so you can actually record it okay so, so do it as, as so long there's as there's not a recording from last week the second class exactly if i if you really want this uh record it yourselves you guys and i i will try of course i'll you know like right now I'm, i push the recording button and i'll stop it and it should I, it should automatically move it to the cloud right but a couple of times it did not move it i don't know why it could be the settings that i did or something so just to be safe, uh, once you record it also, as we go on, we record the lectures, and at least you have a copy for yourself. Okay, and if I, and then this way I can ask you to send me that copy and post it for anybody else that's not able to record. Because not everybody is able to record in the class. So, but I, I will do it myself, of course. And I, I think we should be okay with this one here. But uh, yeah, I gave you the permission to record this, so you can record it yourself. Okay, so um, so let's look at the charts here uh, for this one just to. Respiratory. Mm, All right, so this is the upper, the chart here. So these are the ones that, in general, this is the picture that's in the PowerPoint. So if we look through them, in the medulla oblongata, here we have the um, we have the center, right? So uh, anything that have codeine in it, hydrocodone, uh, dextromethorphan, they work on on the center. Nasal cavity here, we have topical nasal decongestants can work here. Mucolytis can work on the lungs by removing a lot of that secretion in there. Steroids can also work on the lungs and the upper respiratory, I would say. Uh, lung surfactants, that would be the lower. So we're going to go over this next on Wednesday, the one in the lower. Uh, respiratory tract. So let's look at the upper respiratory tract. So we have antihistamines. We have all these drugs here. So uh, can I have someone to go over this, uh, this, these block, these blocks here? Any any volunteers? Just read them through, and then we'll discuss them together. Who wants to do this? Who wants to be a teacher. No teachers in class? Who wants to be a tutor in the future? Any tutors? Should I pick? Do you need us to like just read off the antihistamines? Yeah, just read off and discuss if you can. 
Go ahead. Okay, antihistamine, um, the drug is considered a first generation drug. Mm -hmm. um, the mechanism is the CNA central effect on competitive antagonism of histamine binding to cellular H1 receptors. And so what I get from that is, so it works against the histamine drugs, like those drugs that's listed there, does it, it's the mechanism of it, but it works against some of them? No, it works against histamine. They are antihistaminic. Yeah, so it works against the histamine drugs. Uh, yeah, I mean, we don't have histamine drugs. Histamine is a neurotransmitter that is released by the body, okay? okay. So it's, it causes trouble. Histamine is a chemical that causes trouble to our body, okay? So, you know, it causes the runny nose, the itchy nose, and the swelling, and the, you know, all that. So these drugs kind of reverses the... Uh, action of histamine. Okay. And so indication, uh, older types indicated for severe condition. Mm -hmm. So like you just said, um, nausea, vomiting, secondary to motion, sickness, and vertigo. The second choice to be used for allergic rhinitis, insomnia, allergic reaction, and Parkinsonism. Anti-tussive allergic conjunctivitis and uncomplicated urticaria, mm -hmm. and also um, angioedema. You guys know the different definitions of all these things. Now, when it says here Parkinson's, you guys remember which out of these we talked about when we talked about Parkinson's as a choice. Was it the bromofyranine drug? Uh, actually, uh, I thought it was Bene I thought it was different hydramine. That yeah, was the only one. Right, wasn't it the Benadryl? Yes, Benadryl. That's the one that we discussed. If you remember, as being part of the, you know, Parkinson's. Uh, all right. How about uh, what is allergic conjunctivitis? What does conjunctivitis means? Inflammation of the conjunctiva. And urticaria is what? Uh, it's like it's similar to a skin rash. Skin rash, hives. You know, it's another term for hives. You know that you get. How about angioedema? Swelling of blood vessels. Swelling actually around the blood vessels. So you have leakage of fluids from the blood vessels that lead to edema around the blood vessels in the face and all that. So if you see a puffy face of somebody's puffy face because of allergies, that's because that's called angioedema. Isn't it like, I thought it was caused from the inflammation, the edema caused from like inflammation in the body? Yeah, yeah, inflammation. I mean, edema is another sign of inflammation in general, but angioedema specifically is due to the leakage of fluid from the angio, from the blood vessels outside to cause like what we call a pitting edema, which is, you know, so if you feel the face of that person that has serious allergies, you know, they, they have like puffy faces and, mm -hmm. you know, you can feel it. Okay. <clears throat> side and, uh, go ahead, side effects. Side effects include drowsiness, sedation, and sleepiness. Mm -hmm. um, anti, anti collagenic effects are abduct, which means anhidrosis, blurry vision, dry mouth, urinary, urinary retention, constipation, tachycardia. And it should be avoided with children. Right, because it's sedation type of thing. And, uh, you know. so, uh, so anhidrosis, we, we talked about the abduct. So make sure you remember these things, you guys, for it. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, let me have uh, Kylie go over the second uh, generation ones. For, I have a question. For the mechanism, um, basically, like, do the medications just compete with the histamine on the receptors to inhibit, uh, like, the release? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Good job. So what they do is they go ahead and they go on the receptor, histamine receptors. They block the histamine from accepting the histamine 
and releasing histamine out of the cells. Okay. okay. Um, I, I, I actually have a question. Um, I, I'm, now I'm kind of getting the, this chart, this part of the chart in the PowerPoint kind of confused because you said that a effect of histamine is that it low, it's supposed to have low blood pressure. Um, but when it comes to taking antihistamines, I've seen that it actually can lead to shock and low, low blood pressure to begin yeah. with. Um, On so, what side effect, you mean? Or weird? So a side effect of antihistamine is that a patient could be sedated and go into shock, um, but you also have low blood pressure as a um, effect of histamine itself on the PowerPoint. So I'm just kind of confused of, now I'm kind of confused of its function. Um, okay. Since Hist you said that histamine promotes wakefulness. Yeah, histamine it it uh, causes uh, you know vasodilation. Okay, so when you have vas vasodilation, then you have lower blood pressure. Now, where do you see the shock here? Oh, oh, this is just from his this is just from experience. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, histamine causes that. You know, histamine vasodilation. It causes, um, you know, lower blood pressure, histamine, not antihistamines. Antihistamines reverses this. So it leads to increase in blood pressure. It, incre it increases, vaso it causes vasoconstriction. Antihistamines do that. So, so all these things here, the side effects, are the cause of antihistamines, not histamine. Right. Okay. So, don't confuse the histamines. I gave you the normal uh, actions of histamines because to understand what is antihistamines do, if you understand the actions, then you'll understand how it's, what, why you have the side effects and all that. Because you dry up actually with antihistamines. You know, you, you, right. you know. Mm -hmm. All right, so Kylie's still there? Aaron, go ahead. I'm not sure if Kylie left or not. Give me, give okay. me the second part, please. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. You're going to be so a good teacher, by the way, if you don't know that yet. I'm sorry? You're going to be a good teacher also, I can tell. Oh, thank you. Even, my, even my blip and all. <laughs> all right. Um, okay, so this, is, so this part is just uh, presenting the second generation. Um, drugs um, with Zyrtec, Claritin, and Allegra. Um, very similar mechanisms, um, you know, so, um, so not, not much of a difference, but they, um, but it, it's, um, it's use, it, it's used for it, uh, for patients is a lot different. Um, so it says here, newer type, um, because these have these are very recent, um, they're used for mild to moderate conditions. So basically, the short term and not as severe symptoms as a first generation would be prescribed for. Mm -hmm. um, and what's nice is that um, they have lesser side effects in first generation, um, no sedation, and are able to be used with the children because mm -hmm. they don't have as many side effects. Very nicely put. I like that. You gave us a story. So now we're going to get Betsy to tell us about the non-steroidal non decongestants. Are you there, Betsy? Yeah. Okay. Um, so non-steroid decongestants include uh, pseudofedrin, vanillin, oxymetazine, and tetrahydrosoline. Good job. Uh, they cause vasoconstriction in the nasal mucous membrane. Uh, it shrinks what, swollen what nasal... Classification, I'm sorry. What classification do they belong to? Non-steroidal decongestants. Mm -hmm. And they are specifically, their mechanism is, they act as... What is it written in red there? Sympatho. Sympa sym sym oh. Yes, yes, go ahead, continue. Sympathomimetic and agonist. Correct. And can you break this down? See if you can understand what it says. 
Um, sure. So it causes vasoconstriction. So I'm, and... I'm, I'm saying sympathomimetic. What would oh. sympathomimetic means? Um, what does sympatho pertains to? Anybody else can help her out? The sympathetic. Good job. Um, um, nervous system, right? Nervous so, system, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So sympatho and then mimetic. What does mimetic mean? What does mimicking mean? To act as? Yeah, yeah. To stimulate, absolutely. Absolutely. So sympatho, mimetic, Alpha agonists. So does it like mimic the effects of like the sympathetic nervous yes. system? Yes. On what? What receptors? Alpha. <clears throat> Alpha receptors, yes. And they are what? They're agonists also. That means what? Promoting. Promoting. Good job. All right. Get ready, uh, Gabby. You're next. So go continue, Betsy. Okay. Um causes vasoconstriction in the nasal mucous membrane. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be decreasing, like the fluids going into that area mm -hmm. to dry it up and it shrinks swollen nasal mucous membranes and reduces tissue hyperemia and edema. So like what I was saying, like less fluids into that area reduces the edema and the swelling. What does hyperemia mean? Mm. A lot of blood flow, blood yeah. flow. Yeah, yeah. So you're promoting blood flow in there in that area. So it reduces the blood flow to the area. So it reduces the blood flow. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, some of the um... indications: nasal congestion, sinus congestion, eustachian tube congestion. Uh, the common cold, sinusitis, and allergic rhinitis. Okay. And, uh, uh, side effects or adverse effects, local stinging and burning, rebound congestion if used more than three consecutive days. Good job. And then CNS excitation, sympathomimic effects. Sympathomimic effects. What are kids? Sympathomimetic. Sympathomimetic effects. Mm -hmm. um, what is the... Where's the station tube? At? Is that near the like ear? Yeah, like, it's part of the so, like that's connecting to the ear, like sinuses to the ear, or something like that. What part of the ear does it come from? The inner ear. Any, anybody, anybody, uh, anybody else? Inner, middle, or outer, or external? Inner. I think it's middle ear. Middle ear, absolutely. The middle ear, you guys. Comes out of the middle ear, it goes to your throat, station two. So, um, okay, good job. All right, Gabby, give me the next one. Okay, so these medications are all steroidal decongestions, mm -hmm. and I've used Flonase before, so I'm guessing that most of these are all of them are like um, nasal sprays mm -hmm. that you just put into your nose. Um, so they're um, used to like relieve inflammation. Uh, the mechanism is not known. And since they're used to relieve inflammation, uh, they're also used to treat seasonal allergic rhinitis, which is like an inflammation in the uh, like sinuses, I think, one of them. Um, and yeah, then, the nasal cavity in general. And they're seeing what is seasonal means. Uh, like some people have like spring and like right. fall, like to pollen and stuff like that. Right. They come, they come in different seasons, depending yeah. on the season that you get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after um, nasal polyps removal, so I'm sure there'd be some inflammation um, due to the removal. So absolutely help with that. Mm -hmm. And then um, <clears throat> since it is like a spray, um, it can cause the local burning irritation and singing in the nasal cavity. Mm -hmm. And since it is a decongestant, it will cause some dryness um, 
due to, I think you said vasoconstriction to help with like uh, the congestion. Mm -hmm. um, and then the steroids can also cause suppression of healing um, in patients. Very, very nicely put. You have a good job. Uh, Emilio, you want to give me uh, anti -tossives? Haven't heard your voice for a while. Are you there? All right, Stephanie. Okay, um, anti tosses. These are they're uh, grouped into two. We have the narcotics, which contain codeine, so codeine and hydrocodone. Mm -hmm. And for the mechanism, it is used to suppress the cough reflex located in the medulla obligata. Mm -hmm. um, for the indications, suppress cough and non-productive cough. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the most preferred due to the many side effects, which include slow heart rate, respiratory depression, um, GI distress, and CNS distress as well. And it is drug to drug interacted with the NAOIs. Mm -hmm. And uh, CNS uh, symptoms, distress, uh, respiratory distress, CNS, what, what CNS do you think we were dealing with here? Uh, I, I, go ahead. Sedate, sedation. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, your respiratory distress. Remember, we talked about codeines, how they can distress, distress your respiratory system and the CNS by putting you into becoming sedated because of it. So, nicely put. Um, let's see here. L how about Joy? Joy, uh, give us the non-narcotic ones. No, Joy? Selena, are you on? It looks like they're on, but they're not actually. I'm not sure. All right, who's on? Sam, are you on? Oh boy. Okay, so now we're cutting down. Uh, Nolan? Kinga? That's weird. Yeah. Oh, Kinga's here? Okay, great. Yeah. Go ahead, Kinga. Everybody? Okay, I'm starting recording this just. Uh, Okay, let's go ahead and uh, we'll review the exam first, and then uh, then we'll get into the lecture part. So let me get that out of there. Okay. Um, is everyone on? How many people do I have on? I'm not sure. Just probably. Okay, let's go ahead and start. We'll start with the exam and then, uh, and then we'll go on. Uh, can you see the screen, everyone? Yes. Okay. All right, this question here, uh, the nurse, notes and a female uh is this okay let's you know I, I don't need to read every question tell me if this question is okay if you want me to go over it are we okay with this one All right. did you give that one back because i thought before i had that and it was marked wrong which one this one here in yeah. alcohol breast breast cancer it was marked wrong. Well, this is the right answer. It should be there. This is exactly what the answer key is. Right. So I'm, I'm just opening up the answer key. 
So this is actually what okay. you should have. Now it's marked right. That's fine. But this morning it was marked wrong. So I don't know. This question or a different one? I changed one with the triphasic and biphasic, but I changed it again. So we should be okay with the biphasic. But I'll, let's see. Let's go over the whole thing and see what, uh, what goes on. So how about the nurse uh, might use estrogen in the management of the following? Is this okay? Stage four breast cancer, which is breast cancer. All right, is uh, this one here okay? Patient to receive testosterone therapy via transdermal patch. All right, what about this progestin? Uh, that one increases um, LDL. Yeah, decreases HDL, isn't it? No, it increases HDL. It's remember I mentioned even it's a, it's good actually for HDL. It improves HDL and lower LDL in the long term, so it's it's good. I thought it increases LDL and decreases no. HDL. If you increase LDL, then you're in trouble. You know, then nobody takes because LDL is the bad cholesterol. So that's why that's one of the benefits actually of progesterone, which is increasing HDL. It's in the notes. It's in the. Um, what about this, you guys? The nurse is op is preparing to administer the. Um, this is fine. This is straightforward for Depo Provera. Uh, this one with the appetite stimulant, we know that uh, progestin and estrogen in general they they uh, they improve uh, appetite. Nurse reviewing the use of obstetric drugs. Which situation is indication of magnesium sulfate? Yeah, magnesium sulfate is a uh, uterine uh, relaxer. So premature labor, if you're going into a premature labor, then uh, they, they calm you down with magnesium sulfate. While discussing options of osteoporosis prevention, the patient asks, are we okay with this answer here? What about this one here? I think these came out of your book, I believe. Dr. J, I actually had a question yes. about the magnesium sulfate one. Speak up, I can't hear you. I said I had a question about the magnesium sulfate. Yeah. Uh, couldn't it be used for cervical stenosis because it relaxes smooth muscle? Okay, magnesium sulfate is uh you said cervical stenosis yeah uh is is it a choice cervical stenosis yes um uh, okay i mean magnesium sulfate is straightforward used for labor you know like if you're laboring prematurely or something like that and you're contracting then you calm you calm you down uh you know cervical stenosis is just narrowing off the of the cervix Okay, so, um, so it, if you have narrowing of the cervix, even though you relax the cervix, uh, you know, like the muscles, but it doesn't mean that it will open it up. And then in this case, you know, there's what, what is the uh, connection between uh, the question? Where is the question at? What question is that? Uh, here, direct, you know, we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, like having premature labor uh, in reviewing the obstetric drugs. Um, which situation indication? Yes. So in, in this case, it indicated for anything that has to do with premature labor. Uh, so... Uh, Wouldn't uh, cervical stenosis also be an obstetric, pro or obstetric problem? Yeah, yeah, it could be a problem. But in this case, it's not, you know, uh, that's not, if you have cervical stenosis, you know, magnesium sulfate is not going to solve the problem. You have to go through a C-section. I mean, so if, you, if you're, if, if the cervix is sten stenosed, that means it's very narrowed and it's very hard for anything to come out of it. So magnesium sulfate is not going to do the job. So you have to do a C-section on the woman and get, it out, get the baby out in this case. Okay, thanks. All right, so let's go into this one 
here. Uh, right. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you need a lot of water with fossil masks. It's on the, on the slide, I think, one of the slides. This one is okay also. Uh, that's the pill after, we call it. We, we mentioned it in class. Uh, number 11, 50 year old postmenopausal woman came into estrogen replacement therapy. So, following, don't need to worry about. Yeah, well, it's, it promotes, you know, it, it fixes osteoporosis. So, everything else, yes, but this one is the only one that we don't have to worry about. All right, HCG is the test to do just in case before you put anyone on birth control pill, you have to see if she's pregnant or not. All right, this is the one that I think uh, a couple of people had. Um, uh, yeah. So postmenopausal woman is to receive uh, estradiol to control her menopausal symptoms, which of the following would the nurse include when teaching um, Uh, when teaching the woman about possible adverse effects of the therapy. Now we know that in general, estrogen can cause clotting. We know that already. But in this case, uh, the breakthrough bleeding is the issue in, in this situation. And um, actually thick, thickening, thickening of the endometrium will cause the clotting and the bleeding, not thinning because you have thickening of the uterus at the end. So this one uh, would be the best uh, answer here because we know that you, ha you always have breakthrough bleeding because of these uh, estrogen and progesterone issues. Dr. J. Yeah. Um, can we revisit that question with the uh, HDL and LDL? Yeah, what, what's going on? You said that, I'm just trying to uh, make sure I get it right for my notes because, um, uh, where did it go? The notes up. Um, I did put increase LDL and decrease uh -huh. HDL. So you're saying it's increase HDL and decrease LDL? Let me see what I have on, on, on the thing. If, if, it, if it's wrong, then I'll give you the credit. Hold on. I put the let same me. thing in my notes. Yeah, let me, let me double check. Hold on. Let me see. Is it for estrogen or progesterone? Which, which one were we talking about? Let me see, hold on. Uh, progest progestin. Yeah, progestin. Yeah. I have it written in my notes from when you were going through a lecture. I write as you talk. Okay, okay. Yeah, I had the same let, me, let me see if, if that's what, uh, I'll put that down or not. Uh, It's probably one of the slides here.
Um, so mixed antitussives with expectorants. Mm -hmm. um, so that's dextromethorphan mm -hmm. with um, gustafine phenicin mm -hmm. um, and dextromethorphan and promethozide. Mm -hmm. um, and those suppress the cough, mm -hmm. um, which is like the reflex in the medulla oblongata. Um, and they treat like a severe cough. Mm -hmm. And then they have the same side effects as uh, narcotic and non-narcotic um, antitussives. Yeah. And they're used for what again, usually, indication? Uh, uh, for a severe cough. Okay, and up there it says uh, non-productive cough, right? And it's so right. narcotics and mixed. Okay, flu and all that. Great. All right, so expectorant. Anybody that's on that did not do one, you want to try doing the expectorants? Is Angie on or somebody else? No? All right, so this is it. So we'll, uh, you know, you guys can uh, put this together and then, uh, so we're all set. So what we'll do is, uh, let me see here to make sure that, okay, stop. I'm gonna stop. If I end, then I can, uh, you know, I'm gonna just go to end and then it will give me the choice. Okay, guys, so I'll see you on uh, doing pacifist at 12.30. Any questions before we go? Dr. J, is this um, Zoom that you sent out just now, is this gonna be the new, um the new login? No, no, no. We'll go back to the other. You know what? I, I I need to check my settings and see what I've done wrong. I think I played with the settings yesterday and I kind of changed maybe one thing that got me lost. So what I'll do is, if anything, um, or maybe I should leave this one. You know, I'll leave this one and take away the other one but I'll change the time back to eight o'clock. That, that's a good idea, Natasha, I'm, I'm glad you. So I'll keep this one. And what I'll do is I'll just change the time. I'll start at eight o'clock as like we used to, because this one is, I know it's working, so I'll keep this one. That's a good idea. Okay, all right, I'll do that. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, I have a, uh, yes. oh, I have a, actually I have a question. I am, um, I'm looking over the chart. I, I, I'd like to consider a change with the side effect for the first generation. Um, you can, for when you, it says under side effects, you actually can use with children Benadryl there. You just have to give like a really, really small dose. For Benadryl? Uh, yeah. Yes. Because I've seen yeah. that there's Benadryl for kids, um, you know, and it's actually good uh, for, um, kids with them that are immune compromised at an early age. Um, so I just wanted your input on that. Yeah. I mean, it's not recommended for kids, you know, but if, if anything, uh, it's not being, uh, uh, it's not a no-no, you know, like you said, absolutely a very, very small uh, dose would, would be okay. But if you overdose just a little bit, then the kid will be sedated and they'll be in trouble, you know? So that's why you gotta be careful with it, you know, that's all. So this is assuming that there's too much of, of the first generation? Uh, yeah, I mean, you over, you, see with, with kids, they can't handle sedation. They can't handle these things that an older person maybe possibly can sedate. You know, they fall down, right? So if they're sedated, what's going to happen to them? They, they can injure themselves easily, you know? And um, so that's why it's not recommended, but it's usable. I mean, I, you know, you can give it to them with a very low amount and probably the sedative will be small, but you need to give it to them in a certain amount to, to make sure that it's effective. You know, there's, there's the effective dose also, you know? So we can't, uh, just for the sake of just giving it to them in a lower dose, but it has to be very effective depending on their weight and depending on uh, their, their health also. So um, again, it's not recommended, but if you use it, you can use it. It's not like it's, you can never use it. You know. So for so for a text question, um, you know, if it were to be asked, like if the first generation can be used for kids, it's, it's not wrong to say yes, you can. Yeah, the, you know what? Uh, here, uh, don't don't read into the question too much, Aaron. You know, it, 
here we, we say, you know, the book also, this is coming out of your book, it says that it's if for children, it's not recommended to use Benadryl, use the other ones, you know, Zyrtec and all that. But if, uh, but I agree with you that you can use it. But again, because of the serious side effects, it's not recommended to give to children. That's it. So, okay. so the question on the test, if it says, which of the following is recommended for children, don't choose Benadryl. Okay. You see what I'm saying? So okay. Okay, use the other, you know, because gotcha. that's, that's probably fantastic. Dr. Yes, Stephanie. Um, I had a question about pathophys. Pathophys? Yes. Yeah. Um, so like with the slides, in, com in combined, they're like um, almost 200 slides. If we like focus on the study guide and the focus point, do we have a higher, like a high chance of doing better? On the test, you mean? Yes. On yeah. The, on the test, make sure that the focus points are there. Do them. Uh, that's the number one thing. you. That's why I gave you those focus points. But I needed to include that material for you to get you ready for the NCLEX. That's why I uh... The PowerPoints, you need all that. Yeah. But, but uh, so when you review for the NCLEX in the future, make sure you know details about this. You know, and, and, I mean, read those slides very well. And make sure you understand all that material very well. Okay. But for your test, to do well on the test, you know, that's why I gave you those focus points. Because the and the study guide, guide as well? And the study, the study guides and the focus points kind of go hand in hand. Hand in hand, yeah. Because okay. you'll find some answers in the study guide that, uh, that are answers of the focus points. Okay. So they go hand in hand. But for the test, the number one, find the answers for the focus points. That's the number okay. one. And then uh, do the study guide and then review the PowerPoints as much as you can, of course. But the focus points would be the, you know. But uh, I know I know it's, it's you know, it's uh, heavy, but uh, listen, the majority of the questions on the NCLEX will be pathophys, which are your, uh, you know, um, uh, nursing diagnosis in general, right? Okay. They're right yeah. there, the patho they're mechanisms. A lot of them is like, you know, increased perfusion to the lung, right? You know, that's a mechanism. So w these are nursing diagnoses that you find in that list. And they ask you about this always in the NCLEX, you okay. know, assessing and all that treatment, therapeutics, you know, and uh, so uh, we'll talk more about this when we get to 1230. But, okay. uh, but yeah, I, uh, yeah, focus points first, I would say. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else before I end? Okay, so I'll see you guys uh, soon. Bye, Dr. J. Right, bye, thank, thank you. you. Bye. You're welcome. And I think it's in this one.